There is a big inner revolution that is coming up. Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi, the most important spiritual figure in the world today. Please join us on this special program of Audrey Hope's Real Women. My name is Audrey Hope, and welcome to Real Women. It is a great honor to be in the presence of the most important spiritual figure in the world today, Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi. Sri Mataji is a world leader and has traveled the globe many times over to give self-realization to thousands. Self-realization is the pure connection with our spiritual nature and is the only hope for a stable society. Today is that day prophesied by the saints. Once you may have needed to travel to the Himalayas or to meditate on a mountain for 20 years. But now through the grace of Sri Mataji, there is a simple way to achieve that connection and that is through Sahaja Yoga. Sri Mataji founded Sahaja Yoga as a method for human beings to experience the truth within and to become their own master. Sri Mataji is a mother and a grandmother a true role model for all human beings. Sri Mataji was a spiritual guide for Mahatma Gandhi. She accepts no money for realization as she says the truth cannot be paid for. She joins us after her fourth visit to the United Nations and before her journey to Washington, D.C. Sri Mataji is known all over the world. She is least known in the United States, but it is here in the midst of media and its power where she is needed the most. Sri Mataji, we are deeply honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin <coughs> by speaking about self-realization and to tell the viewers what self-realization is. Within yourself lies a power which is called in Sanskrit language as Kundalini, which is in the sacrum bone. That means definitely that the Greeks knew this was a sacred bone where this power was lying. This is the power which connects you to the all-pervading power. Now the truth is that you are not this body, this mind, this ego, these conditionings, but you are the pure spirit because you say, my ego, my body. You are the pure spirits. This is one truth about yourself. The another truth is that there is an all-pervading power of divine love. It's called by various names. You see these beautiful flowers. It's a miracle itself. And who runs our heart? We never inquire. We don't find. But doctors will tell you it's an autonomous nervous system. But who is this auto? So these two things we have to realize that we are the pure spirit and there is the all-pervading power of divine love, power of love, not of hatred. How does one receive self-realization? Does a person have to give up their personal life or solve problems <laughs> before they can attain this? It's very simple that within our being a complete machinery is already made through our evolutionary process and we have seven centers, main seven centers placed on our central nervous system or we can call it on the parasympathetic and ultimately this power rises, penetrates through these six centers only, ultimately pierces through the fontanel bone area and connects you to that all-pervading power. While it is traveling through these chakras or the centers or the energy centers, we can call them, it nourishes them. It not only nourishes, it integrates them and it enlightens them. Most of the problems, global problems, are because of human beings. And most of the human problems are because of these centers. Because these centers 
cater to our physical, mental, emotional and spiritual needs. So once these centers are out of care, we have all these problems, whether on an individual basis or on a collective basis. So when this connects to the all-pervading power, then you achieve a new state of awareness. So there's a breakthrough in your evolution. Evolution process is spontaneous. We have not paid for it, we didn't do anything, we have become human beings. <laughs> so now, the last one, why should we pay for it or why should we do anything about it? Does one need blind faith or can this be approached as you say, or how is it approached, like a science? It's just a living process. You try to understand this way that this Mother Earth is there. What you have to do is to put one seed in it and the seed sprouts. How? Because it is built in in the seed to sprout and built in in the Mother Earth to make it sprout. It's as simple as that. Uh -huh. you know, we Americans are very into scientific <laughs> proof. <laughs> um, and you describe Sahaja Yoga as an essence of all religions and not just a religion. So, um, how, how is Sahaja Yoga different? Saha means with. Dhyav means born. Born with you is the right to have this union, the yoga. That is Sahaja by this union you realize that all the religions were flowers born on one tree of spirituality. But we have plucked the flowers and now we are fighting with the dead flowers. If there is one God, then why could we, how could we fight in the name of God? <laughs> this is the philosophy of Gandhi also. He also followed the same philosophy. Not only, but as we worship all the incarnations and all the prophets and all the messiahs, in the same way he said we have to worship them. It's not just to show respect, but you must worship the same way. That is Sahaja religion, which encompasses all the religions and also respects, because in essence all of them are the same, and if there's one singular message in all these religions is that seek yourself to be born again. That's the message in all the religions. So where has the religion gone wrong? We are, um, let's take Christianity, Christianity for example. <laughs> Christianity has gone wrong at a very early stage, I should say, where it was taken over by Paul. I asked my father when I first saw his name in the Bible, I said, who is this Mr. Paul? He said he's a squatter. He had nothing to do with Christ. He never met Christ. He had actually killed so many Christians, he had killed a disciple of Christ called Stephen. But being a bureaucrat, he thought it was a good platform to jump onto the platform of Christianity. And he had to have help from somebody, one of the disciples. The worst disciple of Christ was Peter. So he grabbed Peter. And written in the Bible, despite all the things they have done, that Christ told Peter that a Satan will catch hold of you. It's clearly said. Now this Mr. Peter and Mr. Paul put together, tried to spoil all the great work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because, first of all, the worst for women. Paul hated women from his heart. And that's why even Christ's mother, he uses a word like woman. To us, she's a goddess. She's a Mahalakshmi, to Sajogi. But to him, she was just a woman. And the way he has conducted the whole thing has brought such a disaster on the women of the West. Even now, up till now, women are treated as something very low for spirituality. But in India, a woman is the Shakti, is the power. The another great mistake they have committed in describing the Trinity. We have the God, the Father, 
God the Son. And the third one is a holy ghost, is a dove. How can you have a father and a son and no mother? But there is a primordial mother which was accepted by all the religions. Even the Jews had it. Greeks call it Athena. Athena in Sanskrit means primordial. Athena. In India it is called as Adi Shakti. In every religion they had this mother who was the primordial mother. So they, he cancelled all the powers of a mother. And that is how the women have a very inferiority complex, I think, or insecurity in the Western world, because <coughs> they think uh, we have to all the time be at an apologetic end, apologetic end, and we should always serve the men, and we should sell our body, uh, we should make ourselves very attractive, otherwise we have no place. And that is how the morality of women is shattered. I wanted to use a quote from that Paul said in Timothy 1 to really emphasize this point. Um, it says in the Bible, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not present a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Mm. She must be silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who, who was deceived and became a sinner. That's also a mistake about Adam and Eve also, but that I'll deal later on. But the simple thing is that it was a complete attack on womanhood. And that's how women have accepted. Imagine such a developed country like England was discussing till yesterday whether a woman should preach or not. Yes, I mean, now with great difficulty some people have agreed that women should preach. I just don't understand. In India, a woman is very powerful. She doesn't care for her husband if he goes after another woman. He says, all right, she, he is sinful, let him go to hell. I don't care. She stands on her own merit, on her chastity. She doesn't bother. Now the whole situation is so bad that women have to be all the time trying to, you see, expose their body also. I haven't seen a single film in which a man is exposed. As always the women must be exposed as if men are some sanctum sanctorium. I feel the slavery of women is much more in the West than in India. And how about the Qur'an, um, speaking about the Iranians? I know you did a program this week, and it was a very important program. And I'd like to talk about how the Iranian people have misinterpreted Mohammed and the effect it had on our society and the importance of it changing for women. Yes. Even Muhammad Saab, you see, he respected women so much. Uh, you know, they used to have wars. They were tribes. The tribal people, it was only Muhammad Saab who could take birth in those horrible Arabs. And he found that so many men, young men were killed. So he said, all right, if there are not young men, let the old men marry girl, even young girls. Doesn't matter. But marry even if they have to marry five times, marry, so that they do not become prostitutes. Just to respect their chastity, he prescribed this thing, but it is not compulsory that you should marry five times. See, we have horrible things in India. A man marries four times, has eight children each time, because they believe that by that democracy they will be powerful. Then after some time they divorce their wives, but must by saying three times, talak, talak, talak. Now these women are, with so many children, are just left on the street. And if you see them, you think that this is worse than Somalia. He respected women. Not only he told his wife that you are going to work out Aisha, he told that you are going to work out something against the religion. And really it was wrong on her because his own daughter, as you know her name was Fatima, stood up and said that this never Muhammad Sahib had said. But this Abu Bakr is a fellow who just took the platform as it is, I should say, instead of his own son-in-law, Hazrat Ali, who was a great realized soul. And he just 
completely changed uh, the ideas about women, which Fatima was going to tell. So there were uh, big wars called Karbala, in which two children of Fatima B were killed. Hazrat Ali was also killed. And there were two groups were formed, one is Shia and Sunni. But Shias also don't understand that they have to respect their women because Fatima B itself was a not only a saint but an incarnation. She was a goddess. How has the media affected our view of women today? In the Western media, I must say that women are used just to lure some sort of uh, uh, very low type of human beings, I should say. Men are not sex points, they are the spirit. They are reduced to this sex point by Freud. And Freud was like a Christ here once upon a time. Now, of course, after so many years, I said this at least twenty years back, but now it is appearing, many, I have seen some books like fall of Freudian empire, Freudian <coughs> Freud. So many books are coming now, already the, all the harm has been done. Human beings are reduced to a sex point now by media, and women who are very cheap, who can expose their body and can uh, sell their chastity, are regarded as great heroines. This is what is the situation of the media is today. You have even said that Freud could only prosper in America. Huh? Freud could only prosper in America. Yeah. He said that. It's a fact. He was born in Austria, and when I talked against uh, Freud, they all clapped. They were very happy, I said so, because they were quite ashamed about it. But even in Austria, you find so many prostitutes on the streets, standing all the way. But here, at least, there it is the housewives are housewives. Here, even a housewife has to dress up in such a way that she should be like a prostitute. Why should you do that? You must have your self-respect. How, how is this a special time for women? I call it this a blossom time, because I see there are many flowers, so many of them are on this earth and they are to become now fruits. But it's called as Kiyama in the Quran, meaning the resurrection time. Even in the Indian scriptures we have this resurrection time, and by many astrologers, thousands of years back it was predicted that such and such time will come. And also in the Bible it is the last judgment. This another stupid idea which we find in Bible and also in Quran, which is very stupid. And I think also, I don't know about the Torah, but they said there is also the same idea previous. That at the time of resurrection, our dead bodies will come out of the grave, <laughs> and then they'll ascend. Now tell me what is left in the grave of the dead body. It is so absurd, it's so illogical. Actually, in that way, I would say the Indian scripture said the correct thing, that at this time of Kali Yuga, all the souls which are lost, all the souls who want their realization, all the souls who have uh, been thinking of God and seeking God all over the world will be reborn. That's why we have a population problem. That is why uh, all kinds of horrible people are also born. In this time, about twenty years back, your media was much better. They didn't show such horrible scenes. I mean, they must show bedroom scenes. What is the need? Bathroom scenes. I mean, if somebody comes into your house, do you take them to your bedroom and to your bathroom, or you keep them in the drawing room? <laughs> I mean, it's private life. They have no respect for privacy. Now, you see, this kind of funny idea that we are going to get out of the graves and all that, is still lingering in the minds of many ignorant Christians and also Muslims. One Bosnia fellow met me, he was Muslim. I asked, me, asked him, why were you dying there? What was the need to die? He said, because if we die now in the name of God, we'll be resurrected. <laughs> I 
mean, it is relevant from the idea of Bible, you see. So this is what it is that these ideas are to be put right. In the West, you see, we have Christianity, we have other religions. But I would say that the roots of the spiritual knowledge is more in India. I am myself born in a Christian religion. But the roots about it, the explanation about it, is much better discovered in India because an ancient country which has been all the time seeking, seeking for thousands of years. Mm. Now the system that is Sahaja Yoga, as you mentioned, is not mine. It's an ancient system. Mm. But we had this system in the North country, they call it, they were in the center. And one master will have only one disciple. This was the tradition. So there were very few people who got realization. Sri Rama's father-in-law's guru was Ashtavakra. He has written about Sahaj. But he just described what happens when you get into the state of spirit. This father-in-law, Janaka, gave realization to only one person, Nachiketa, according to the tradition. But in the twelfth century there was a great poet in India, in Maharashtra, born as Ganeshwara, who asked his guru, his own brother, that let me also tell about this. He said, all right, he permitted. So in his book, Ganeshwari, which is just the explanation of Gita, he has clearly said in the sixth chapter about Kundalini, how she rises, how she gives you realization and everything. But those people who were in charge of religion, as usual, didn't know how to do it. So what they did, they said, this is Nishidham, you cancel, you don't read this sixth chapter. So nobody would read that chapter. That's how it went into my ground. So what I would say, after that, many great saints like Guru Nanak, Kabir, Tukarama, Ra, uh, Ramdas, in the sixteenth century did a great work of Kundalini. Even in the Bible it is, I will appear before you like tongues of flames tree of life, so many things are described. But in the little time that they had, they could not explain so much. Now these people have talked about Kundalini and said about it. If I have done any work, is this, that by studying to human beings, I met many people because my father was a very social man and my husband was in a position where I met many people. I studied human beings. And I found out a method by which you can now give a ah, mass realization. Mm -hmm. In Russia, in Bulgaria, Romania, we always have people in the stadium, not less than 16,000, and they all get their realization. And they are very sensitive to spirituality and they stick to it. None of these false gurus could stick there. Psychics, the issue of psychics, it's so popular here. And we are very, um, it, it's, it's very dangerous. Could you explain what can happen? Hi, Americans are very simple people, I must say. First time I came for parapsychology, they took me into a hall of parapsychology. But I told them, you are dealing with dead spirits. And they were very angry with me. You said that you come as guest and what do you Krishna? I said, I have to tell you the truth, I'm your mother. And I'm not your guest, I, you didn't pay for me, I came on my own on my vehicle and going on my vehicle. Why well, they had made money out of me. So they don't like it. When I first came here, when I told them that these are all spirits and psychic things and don't do it, they didn't like it. How can we know a false guru? First of all, you cannot pay for your self-realization or for any knowledge. You must value your life. If you don't value your life, then you will go to all such stupid people and you will waste your time. Mm. Now, if you value your life, if you value your money, for example, you will first find out what is this you are buying. First of all, you must see the disciples. What are they doing? What is their style? 
What have they gained? What is their knowledge? First, the disciples. Most of them are recluses. Anything which is sort of fashionable, people want to do. You talk of individuality, all right? Any entrepreneur, now they can start six inches of skirts, everybody will have six inches of skirts. Otherwise, you are not in, within the lunatic asylum. So, like that, these people are good at big advertisement, marketing, writing books, all false. You believe them because they have a knack. Advertising is the main thing which has led to this kind of thing, and Americans are really very sensitive to advertising. If anything is advertised, they think it's great. Also, I was surprised when I came here. They asked me, in Boston, I remember, they asked me, how many Rolls Royces you have in the television? I said, I don't have. I said, then you don't make any money? No. I said, I don't make any money. So there's no business? No, I said, no. We are not interested. They wouldn't have me on the television. I mean, you are so money oriented that tomorrow you will purchase God also, I think. So, first of all, you cannot do so. Second, you must see the disciples, what sort of disciples they are, what they are, how much they are talking about uh, the knowledge. They must have the knowledge. Now, you know very well, and people can find out that in Sahaja Sahaj Yoga, people just get realization and start giving realization first. So many diseases have been. It's a fact. There's a book written. So we are in a new stage of human evolution. Of course. This is the time. If you miss it, you'll miss it forever. Because, you see, otherwise, you should see in America, people are getting destroyed from within. All kinds of diseases, psychological problems, these, that, stress, this, that, all kinds of things are going on. Now, to stop it, better offend above all. Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi, please join us for part two of this special program on Audrey Hope's Real Women. <laughs>